I really miss TNA. I really, really, truly do. More than I've probably ever bothered to actually express via video or social media format. I really, really do. And I know some of you will say, well, that technically, while the company is called Impact or Impact Wrestling or whatever the hell it's called now, it still exists, it's still there. You know what I mean. It's not TNA. It's not the TNA that I became a fan of. It's not the TNA that I watched grow over the years. It's not the TNA that angered and flustered and frustrated me over the years, occasionally excited me over the years. It's just not the same. And everybody knows it. There are so many things I miss about that company. Like, I really, truly mean it. And sometimes, you know, it's really easy to hate on them for a lot of the dumb decisions and bad things they did over the years. But not everything was a failure. They had their successes. And, man, I sure enjoy talking about them nonetheless. I sure miss watching them every week. And maybe someday that company in its current form can get something back, get some type of spark. But it feels like something that just kind of gets kicked into the annals of wrestling history for me never to return. And it's it sad. It really does break my heart. Because there was always a bond there with me and TNA. And that bond has probably irreparably been broken. I even tried to go back and watch the product for a few months this year. And I had to tap. Because I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, who puts that on television and thinks that's a good wrestling product? It's like they weren't even trying. It's like they didn't even care. I, I couldn't even recognize it. I had no idea what the hell they were doing. I mean, it was just, it was that bad. But I really miss it. And it feels like a gaping void in this channel. It's a gaping void for me as a wrestling fan. So as part of the seventh day of OTRS Central Christmas, I wanted to come on here and talk about the seven things I miss most about TNA. The seven things, and there's more than seven for sure. But here are the top seven, going in reverse order from seven to one. Number seven, the X Division. Back when the X Division was something the company took seriously in part because it was their own brand, it was their own belt, when they were dealing with the NWA and their world title, Partially by consequence and circumstance, you had to make the X Division a big deal. Also, when you looked at the type of guys that you had with the company at that time, the AJ Styles and the Samoa Joes and the Christopher Daniels and so on and so forth, your best in-ring talent were all X Division type of guys. So it made sense that you went in that direction. And the X Division to me was like spot fest done right. There's that misconception that... I don't like any type of spot fest at all, or I just hate on it to hate on it. No, that's not true. When done well, when part of a greater portfolio, it could be really, really good. It could be a necessary change. It could be a nice alternative to the other stuff that you see, and that's what the X Division used to be. It was a showcase for some great talent, some great moments, some great highlights in TNA history, and I really miss the X Division. Number six, the Knockouts Division. As much as WWE tries to pretend that because now they care about women's wrestling, finally somebody in professional wrestling cares about women's wrestling, anybody with a brain knows that's complete and total horseshit. TNA, for years, cared about their women on a much more significant level than WWE could ever imagine. While the WWE was calling them divas and giving them two-minute matches on television and no stories and no purpose or anything like that, the knockouts were getting multiple segments. They were getting main event and featured segments. They had characters. They had personalities. They had stories. They had issues. They had all of these things. And at that time, frankly, a lot of the knockouts looked better and most certainly were better talents, in my opinion, than what the WWE had and its diva roster. Again, misconceptions being that I don't like women's wrestling. It, it's an affront to everything about me as a wrestling fan, and that is just simply not the case. I have always been a proponent of, when done right, women in wrestling 
can be a massive gate attraction. They could be a ratings draw. They could be critically and vitally important to the survival of your company. And for several years, the knockouts were an integral part of everything TNA was able to do. And when I look now, I see what it's become. I'm like, oh my God. But I think back to what it used to be, and it was really, really cool. On number five, the, the eternal hope for a second major brand. When TNA came into being in 2002, and you started off with the weekly pay-per-views that I used to buy, and then they eventually got themselves onto Fox Sports Net. If you remember, what was it at? Like Friday afternoon at like 3 o'clock. It was a terrible time slot, but they got out of the weekly pay-per-view model. They actually got themselves some type of national cable television deal, which then eventually morphed into a deal with Spike TV. And all the time as I watched TNA continue to survive, continue to exist, and then start to grow and improve, they win HD. They started bringing in bigger name talents like Sting and the Dudleys and so on and so forth. There was at least some hope, naive as it might have, may have been, for a second major brand. That gaping void in so many of our lives when WCW and ECW died in 2001. TNA was the best chance that we had, is still the best chance we have had since 2001 to have a second major national brand. And I never had any delusions about TNA being able to get to the point where they legitimately bang with the WWE in the ratings and in live event attendance and so on and so forth. My hope for them, the end game would have been somewhere between one and a half to two million viewers doing your shows on the road, perhaps live every week to maybe every other week, but in front of maybe four to six or 7,000 fans, depending on the city and the venue you're in. Well, that's not WWE. That's nothing to see, sneeze at. That's something to be proud of. And that's something at one point in time I was hoping TNA was going to be able to get to that point. And there was a point in time where it felt like maybe they could, but no longer. And once that realization hit me, it really hit me that there was no hope for a second major American wrestling brand. There continues to be no hope. And there really, honestly, will be no hope going forward. And that's kind of a devastating thing as a wrestling fan to think about. On number four, the fresh faces for me, not somebody who watched a lot of independent scene in the 2000s, didn't watch ROH and so forth, seeing the fresh non-WWE talent like AJ Styles and Bobby Roode and James Storm and Samoa Joe and Eric Young and Austin Aries and hell, throwing Shark Boy for the fuck all of it. Even Abyss to a certain degree. All of these guys that were unique to TNA, guys that I had not really seen before, but there was brand loyalty there. There was brand identification there. And how ironic is it now for all of those guys, except for Abyss, they either went to WWE and are not gone like Austin Aries or every other one of them is basically there. AJ, Rude, Joe, Eric Young, you know, James Storm now back again. There used to be something about being able to say, well, you know, while WWE is trying to push Cena and Orton down your freaking throats, I could come here and I could watch TNA and I get something different. I get AJ Styles. I get Bobby Roode. I get James Storm. I get beer money. I get before that Team Canada. You know, so many different things, a different way, a different style, different types of personalities. These guys have felt like we're able to take more risks and take more chances. They were just different and they were fresh to me. And I really miss that about TNA, and most certainly the company now, in its current incarnation, does not have that to the same level or the same degree. Number three, the legends of yesteryear. Definitely something missing from the company now, but over the years, and sometimes uh, to the company's detriment, to the business's detriment, and sometimes to my own detriment as a fan, you had all these faces from the past. You knew eventually we were going to cycle through TNA at some point in time. But there was also some type of appeal to be able to tune in and see a Sting, see a Kurt Angle, see a Hulk Hogan, see Scott Steiner, see the Dudleys. There was an appeal there because for those guys, with those names, with those legacies, there is a place, there is a role for them, a Ric Flair and so on and so forth. You know, you get those types of guys involved. And you get kind of that nostalgia pop and you get that feeling of when wrestling used to be really cool and when you really truly loved it and enjoyed it and screamed from the rooftops how great and awesome this was and the TV that you watch sucks because it's not professional wrestling. 
And you don't really have that anymore. You don't really have that place outside of WWE. And again, I don't always want to go to WWE for that type of stuff. I'd like something different, something fresh. And at least for TNA, even though, like I said, at times, they went way too much to this well, and they went way too often to it, it was still really cool to be able to see, hey, that guy's still alive. Hey, that guy is still wrestling. Hey, Kevin Nash is still here drawing a paycheck and not doing much. God bless him. I miss those legends of yesteryear and being able to tune in every week and be able to see them. On uh, number two, from a channel standpoint, from a wrestling fan standpoint, I miss doing the TNA reviews significantly. Whether it be, assume Jeff Jarrett position! Whether it be the build-up to Bound for Glory 2011, if you remember back in the day and for months how I was all about Sting and Hogan at Bound for Glory, even before that was rumored, even before that was even talked about, and then to ultimately get that payoff, and then to get Bound for Glory, Sting and Hogan in Philly in 2011, and watch them own that Philly smart mark crowd. But you know, back in the old days of the Off the Rope show, while we did the Raw reviews and the WWE reviews together, the TNA reviews were a place that I really established myself as my own personality, my own type of wrestling talker. I did different things. I took different chances. I took risks. I did a bunch of crazy crap, frankly. It was a way for me to really express myself. And it was a way to appeal to different types of wrestling fans and appeal to a different audience because not everybody that watched WWE watched TNA or obviously vice versa. So I feel like it's been to the detriment of the channel that there's not that same second major brand. I feel like it's been the detriment of my videos that I don't have those TNA reviews to do different things about. And I feel like it's the detriment to me as a wrestling fan that I'm not doing those reviews and have no interest to do them in the future. And I really, really, truly miss it. Really, truly miss it. Go face mask and rain, yeah, 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 yeah. All that stuff. I mean, when you talk about things getting over in terms of the, what this channel, when it used to be the Off the Rope show, more things got over from the TNA reviews, I feel like, and from the WWE reviews, and I feel like that's a fact. I'm just saying, man, they used to be so much fun. Yeah, it was cool to do the Raw reviews with the guys and so forth, and the WWE pay-per-view reviews, and that's awesome, and I would never change that. Believe me, I wish I could still do that. But there was always something about the TNA reviews. I watched, and I was chomping at the bit. I couldn't wait to review it. No longer, though. But the number one thing I miss the most about TNA is that it was an alternative wrestling product to WWE. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't always great. Frankly, a lot of times it wasn't even necessarily good. But it was something else that I could latch on to. It was something else that I could turn to. There were periods of time where I felt the product of TNA was significantly better than the WWE. So whereas the WWE could be aggravating me or pissing me off with this, at least I had that hope, that chance, that TNA with impact, that two hours, it would be better, it would be different. It would be something cool that made me not regret still being a wrestling fan. But I miss being able to see an entirely different company, an entirely different way, an entirely different type of product with different types of wrestlers and so on and so forth. I miss all of that. I miss the interacting with the Impact fans. I miss uh, some of the other people that used to do uh, the Impact reviews, specifically Fool Killer and I used to have great banter that we just really don't have anymore because in part, he's mostly given up on the company and you guys know it to be true and I certainly have. It's just not the same. And that really, really sucks. Out of all the things I miss, I miss the fact that there was another company that I could watch and at least be somewhat proud to watch at times, and it wasn't WWE. So there you have it. My list of the seven things I miss most about TNA. I really, truly miss hating to love and loving to hate this company, its product, and everything about it. I really, truly do. Feel free to let me know what you miss most about the old TNA and what you miss that you feel like maybe it could come back and maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But remember, this is OTR Essential. This was the seventh day of OTR Essential Christmas. The sixth day will be coming up soon. Topic to be determined. This is OTR Essential. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Later.